So we've seen that Tamiflu is a really important treatment for influenza. And I said Relenza was an important treatment as well. And we were going to compare and contrast the structures of Relenza and Tamiflu and look for similarities and differences between the molecules. So in the video that accompanies this one, we looked at the structure of Tamiflu and the way in which it interacts with the enzyme. And to remind you, you can see here Tamiflu in red and the enzyme, or at least the active site of the enzyme, shown in blue. And the interactions between the two are clearly marked. Now this next figure, we're going to compare Relenza and Tamiflu. And it's remarkable. You can see that both these molecules, although they were developed by different pharmaceutical companies, Relenza by GSK and Tamiflu by Roche, they both contain a six-membered ring. In both cases, they have a carboxylate at the top and an amide at the bottom of that ring. And in both cases, on the left-hand side, they have a positively charged amine-containing unit. Fundamentally, they have the same structures because they're interacting with the same target enzyme and they have to do it in the same kind of way. They also both have functionality at the kind of four o'clock position of the ring. In Tamiflu, it's a slightly more hydrophobic functionalization than it is in Relenza, where there are a few more OH groups. This is the reason that Tamiflu can be taken as a tablet and still pass through the fatty membranous lining of the GI tract, whereas Relenza has to be inhaled directly into the lungs. Because Relenza is a little bit more hydrophilic, it has to be taken directly by inhalation, whereas Tamiflu is better formulated for use as a tablet. And this shows the way in which chemistry, as well as interacting with the biological target, can be used to tune the properties and the mode of administration of the actual drug itself. So I asked in the video about pKa, and pKa is really a vital concept in organic chemistry. It helps us to understand how acidic or how basic a compound is. And so we need to define clearly what we mean by pKa and get a good understanding of it as a parameter. If we think about a general acid, HA, that equilibrates and it can give off a proton, H+. And that leaves the conjugate base anion, A-. The further the equilibrium lies to the right, the more acidic this compound will appear to be. And we can define a parameter Ka, which is the concentration of protons multiplied by the anion divided by the concentration of HA. And our pKa value is minus a log to the base 10 of Ka. Now, the larger the value of Ka is, the more protons we have. So a large Ka is associated with an acidic compound. A large Ka will be associated with a small pKa because of this sign here in the equation, minus. So therefore, a small pKa goes with an acidic compound. So if the pKa is low, it's acidic. It's somewhat similar to pH, which is something that you used to, where a pH of 1 is an acidic compound and a pH of 14 in water is a basic compound. In fact, there's a relationship between pKa and pH, and we can define that relationship mathematically. If we look at this equation here, and we took a log of this equation, we can say, well, log of Ka equals log of H plus A minus all over HA. To convert this into pKa, we need to put minus sides on each side of the equation. This is then pKa. If we rearrange this in terms of pulling out logarithms, a little bit of a mathematical trick, then we can pull out minus log H plus, 
and that leaves us behind with minus log of a minus over h a. The negative log of h plus is simply pH. So the pKa of an organic compound will be the same as the pH when a minus is equal to HA. So if we have as much of this in the equilibrium as we have this, in other words, if the equilibrium is perfectly balanced, the pH of that solution will be the same as the pKa of the organic compound. And this gives us a good feel for the pKa values of organic compounds. Imagine taking a solution of vinegar, ethanoic acid. If you put a pH meter in that, it would be around pH 3, something like that. That gives us a feeling for the pKa of an organic acid is going to be somewhere around 3 or 4, something like that. These considerations of pKa help us to understand why in Tamiflu, at pH 7, we have a carboxylate group. Because the equilibrium between the carboxylate and the carboxylic acid lies in favour of the carboxylate. Because the pKa of this carboxylic acid is going to be around 4, and so therefore at pH 7 it's not going to be protonated. It's going to have given up its proton. Equally, it helps us understand why in Tamiflu we have a protonated amine, because again, the equilibrium with the unprotonated form, if the pKa of this is approximately 10, then at pH 7, this equilibrium will lie on the acidified side, the protonated side. It's not going to give away its proton under those conditions. And so pKa values help us to understand what is protonated and what is deprotonated. And in complex organic transitions, we're very often going to use acids or bases as reagents. And we're going to need to understand the pKa values of various different organic groups. I thought it would be worth briefly mentioning how viruses like flu can become resistant to drugs like Tamiflu. You may have heard a lot about resistance to drug activity, and we can understand it in biological terms. We now know that Tamiflu acts in the active site of an enzyme. And an enzyme is a peptide-like molecule made in a biological organism. And the way that enzymes and proteins are made is from DNA. In fact, this is the role of genetic material. Genetic material codes the information that gets translated into enzymes and proteins. Now, you should know that any organism gains mutations into its DNA. And these mutations in the code of the DNA lead to mutations in enzymes. And just once in a very small while, an enzyme will come along with a mutation where Tamiflu doesn't work. It can't dock in the active site. But the enzyme perhaps still operates with the natural substrate. That would mean your inhibitor, Tamiflu, would stop working against the mutant enzyme. And if that happens, you have resistance. The Tamiflu cannot act against that specific virus. That virus will go on to dominate the population and pass on its genetic material to further viruses, which will also make the mutant enzyme, which is resistant to the activity of Tamiflu. And it's this ability of mutations to feed into the genetic code of organisms that allows the mutation in enzymes to gain the resistance against pharmaceutical treatments.